Is Liberty dying where you live? Escape to Keen at freekeen.com. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you all for being here on such a lovely morning. <laughs> 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 it's what we're used to in February, right? Thank you. My name is um, Catherine Rogers, and I represent Merrimack County District 28, which is 30. I appreciate all of you traveling long distance. Luckily, I only have a mile to come. Um, <clears throat> I appear before you today in support of House Bill 1632, a bill establishing a criminal penalty. For, for providing a firearm to a person who is prohibited from possessing a firearm. <coughs> Under current state statute, a person who is guilty of a Class B felony if they own or have in their possession or control a firearm and have been convicted in the state or federal court of a felony against a person um, or when related to a controlled drugs. And they're also guilty of a felony if that same person completes and signs an application for purchase of a firearm um, or as a kid ends a convicted felony. House Bill 1632 will add that any person who sells, transfer, or gives, or otherwise provides a firearm to such person who they know to be a prohibited person would also be guilty of a custody felony. To provide the confirmation evidence that that person intended to receive a firearm is not prohibited from possessing a firearm if they're in possession of a valid license to carry under RSA 1596 or if the transfer is approved through the Division of State Police, through permits and licensing. Um, a criminal seeking to obtain a firearm can really do it in one of three ways. They can have a so-called straw purchaser, illegally acquire a firearm for him or her through a federally licensed dealer and hope neither of them gets caught. They can steal a gun, or they can find a seller who won't subject the transaction for that potential. All of which are things that obviously none of us approve or is law approved, but they're done. House Bill 1632 would simply make sure that anyone that assisted in such a venture would be punished equally to the person that actually obtains um, the gun. Bureau of Justice statistics found that nearly 80% of criminal offenders reported that they obtained their most recent firearm through private channels, such as straw purchaser or street, source, street sources. We know through, uh, equally through statistics that New Hampshire is a net exporter of illegal firearms that are used com to commit crimes in other states. This legislation, legislation would help in stopping that flow of guns to other places, illegal guns that are getting into the hands of dangerous people. We need to send a clear message to convicted felons that we do not want to have this continue. We need to stop the violation of those things. We don't want to have people continuing to get those illegal guns to commit crimes. We have the law in fact that they are not allowed to have them now we need to make sure that they cannot continue to use friends, acquaintances, and straw purchasers to do so. This would simply strengthen that law um, that's on the books and make it clear that we don't want people to assist them in doing that. And yes, Mr. Clerk, I do have a copy of my testimony for you. Um, I would thank you for your time and ask that you um, give serious consideration of, of getting on to pass. Thank you very much for your time. I have one question. You indicated that we know that there's a free fall of illegal firearms from New Hampshire to other states. How do we know that? Uh, there's a number of statistics that are out there, we you know, from the Department of um, the FBI Justice Statistics. We know through um, statistics in other states, such as the, near, the closest one we know is in Boston. They attract their um, guns that they can track. We know there's, there's difficulty in tracking guns a lot of times. Um, serial limbs are, are taken off the weapons and so forth, but in Boston, for instance, in guns they've tracked since 2007 to the present, um, that they have reached it and recovered from um, crime scenes. Once they can track that a fifth of the guns that come, or excuse me, a third of the guns that come from um, those crimes come from New Hampshire and Maine, that they've been able to track that. So um, other states, such as Florida, when they've tracked guns, a large amount of them come, again, from New Hampshire. In other states, when they're able to track back guns, and that's difficult to do, obviously, because um, criminals do a lot of things they can to disguise where guns come from. But the ones they can track back, New Hampshire is one of the states throughout the country that's a net exporter of, of illegal weapons that are used in crimes. And those are from various um, crime studies that are done by states, by the FBI, and so forth, and statistics are kept. Did you supply the committee with I will. There's a bill that you're going to be hearing again this week regarding statistics, and I hope to bring forward to you a number of information at that point, yes. Thank you very much. Other questions? 
Representative Bird has a question. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Representative. Uh, you know, you mentioned straw purchase. Isn't that already illegal? It's illegal, but this would help be another another way to stop that, another thing to stop those people that are doing that. Okay. Thank you. I see no other questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Representative Horgan. Representative Timothy Horgan, I represent Stratford County District 6, the towns of Durham and Madbury, and uh, I'm a co-sponsor of HB 1632, so I feel like to uh, underline what Representative Rogers said, that this is a uh, good bill which fills a, uh, fills a hole in the law. The, the key thing about it is, is if you know the language in there, which it says, any person here she knows to be prohibited from firearm for any reason, listen in subparagraph 1B. What paragraph 1B says is if you know they been convicted of a uh, convicted of a, uh, of a felony in that stuff. I think that's pretty much common sense. If you know someone's uh, a felon, or if you know if you know that their um, those felons are, um, are are disallowed from owning guns in New Hampshire um, until they discharge the felony. Um, so I think that's common sense. If you know someone's a felon, you should not be carrying a gun. So that's uh, and not just even if the bill doesn't pass, this is a bad idea because a most, most felons are convicted for good reason, and also um, even if they're even if they're unjustly accused, um, you can get you know, a lot of trouble because it's still illegal for them to have the firearm. And also, if you know the order of a court, once again, maybe not all court orders are justified, but enough of them are. And once again, you're going to get your friend in a lot of trouble if you give him a firearm. Um, if you give him a firearm, if he's caught, he or she is caught with a firearm, that's uh, that's a very serious charge. So, like, even if you have a friend who's been unjustly so like the court order, it's really best not to give him a, give him a firearm if you know what the court order says. So uh, basically, I think this is a good deal, and I, you know, I expect there's going to be some spirited opposition to it. I definitely see someone, there's one libertarian camera here ready to put me on freekeen.com. Um, here I am. Now you agree with that? Yeah. I just don't see any reason, uh, I think this, I don't see any reason why the, uh, why this bill, I don't see any reason why the law, what's submitted in the law is submitted. I think this bill, uh, this bill uh, fills a hole in the existing law. Uh, that's basically, uh, that's basically why I'm, uh, why I'm in favor of it, why I'm responsible. Any questions? I just got a small one. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative. <laughs> you know, I've known you for about almost six years yes. since I've become a free yes. I consider you a friend. Yes. So if I sold you my 380 and you were a felon, which I really don't know if you are, <laughs> would I be in trouble under this law? Uh, well, yes, that's the, that's the point of the law. I can not that matters. I'm in fact not a felon. I have a every clean place record in one of my uh, underneath court orders. So. But just a quick follow-up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, our relationship really has been here, which is friendly. But how would I really know? Well, you know, what somebody's 20 years ago or 10 years ago. If you, uh, well, if you don't know, if you don't know, then that's a defense. That's something that your defense attorney can bring up. If you're charged with it, um, it's probably it's still probably not. It's law is probably not used unless. There's been some problem, problem of some sort. I don't think the, don't think the police have so few crimes that they have never gone around because the rest of the people really nearly just because they may have given a gun away to a friend. All right, thank you. Bottom line is don't give any guns away. There's not much you've got any other questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Susan Olson. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Susan Olson, and I am the Director of Legislation for the Women's Defense League at New Hampshire. I appear this morning in opposition to House Bill 1632, establishing a criminal penalty for providing a firearm to a person prohibited from possessing a firearm. We believe the sponsors of this bill had the old adage if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Who are writing this bill? 
New Hampshire RSA 1596 a entitled Confidentiality of Licenses states, in part, that all licenses issued pursuant to said section are subject to inspection only by law enforcement officials of the state or any political subdivision thereof or of the federal government while in performance of official duties or upon written consent for good cause shown of the Superior Court of the County in which said license was issued. Further, current federal law, specifically 18 U.S.C. 922 sub G, already makes the sale, deliver, or transfer of any firearm to any of the following prohibited persons a federal crime and states what? It shall be unlawful for any person to sell or otherwise dispose of any firearm or ammunition to a person knowing or having reasonable cause to believe that such person, one, is under indictment or has been convicted in any court of crime punishable by imprisonment for more than a term of seven year as a fugitive from justice. There are seven other qualifiers of which I know you are well aware. The League presumes the sponsors understand that private citizens cannot demand revelation of the possession of a New Hampshire pistol or revolver license from a potential buyer, transferee, or heir, and that the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968 clearly delineates the class of prohibited persons. Thus, instead of establishing a criminal penalty for providing a firearm to a person prohibited from possessing a firearm, the League believes the sponsors seek to achieve de facto universal background checks by forcing all sales, gifts, or transfers of firearms to be conducted through the New Hampshire Department of Safety gun law. Even the Department of Safety sees through this charade in the bill's fiscal notes stating, the department, and I add in parenthetical of safety, does note it is possible that the bill would increase the transfer of firearms through the use of a federal firearms dealer and thereby increase the number of background checks completed by the state police gun line and the cost associated with background checks. Allow me to paraphrase the late Justice Scalia in Crosby v. National Foreign Trade Council when he called to mind St. Augustine's enormous remorse at stealing pears even when he was not hungry. Rather than doing something for a good and even defensible reason, like hunger, Augustine stole them just for the devil. The Women's Defense League suggests that rather than disguising the call for universal background checks, perhaps for the devil of it, the sponsors might consider reintroducing 2014's House Bill 1589. We ask the committee vote this bill inexpedient to legislate. Thank you. Are there any questions? Jane, thank you very much. Can we have your Sergeant Haggerty, State Police. Good morning, Mr. Members. Good morning. Well, relatively good morning. We're here. You all made it. Good morning. We do have a position paper which will distribute. Department of Safety is in favor of this bill. I'll speak just briefly on a couple points. And there is a suggestion on, on a change in that bill, some of the work. The Department of Safety views this bill as In relation to 159.7, which is currently on the books, 159.7 is uh, somewhat limited in scope. Uh, this bill uh, appears to expand that scope uh, in the protections of uh, the people 
in New Hampshire and provide a deterrence to those that uh, that may be selling guns uh, illegally, and that is knowingly. We had a question earlier about uh, from Representative Burt about if, uh, if someone sold him a gun or if you sold your gun uh, and didn't know that that person was a felon. Uh, this bill addresses that in the language uh, state of mind of knowing so that it wouldn't be relevant in that case. Uh, you'd have to know that the person was a prohibited person. So if you knew that your friend was just served with a domestic violence petition and then you went ahead and sold that gun and that petition prevented the possession of a firearm and you went ahead and sold that gun to that person, that would be a knowingly, uh, a knowing act and that would is that a problem and subject to a violation of this bill of the past? The wording that uh, that we'd like to uh, have looked at would be if the bill were to be uh, approved, we'd like to amend the wording in the, in the section which which talks about the transfer was approved through the Division of State Police Permits and Licensing Unit gun line and, and that wording change would be or in the case of a rifle or shotgun through the Federal Bureau of Investigative Investigation National Instant Criminal Background Check NICS check system. Because as everyone knows here I believe the long gun purchases in the state which are done through an FFL go through the federal system and handgun sales go through the state police gun line. One other word that uh, would need to be cleaned up, I believe, in the bill is uh, referring to the uh, permits and licensing gun line. That's the accurate reflection of, of what that, uh, what we do in the title. Uh, believing the word police before that would be, uh, would be something that we would look at. You happy to answer any questions? Any questions of that? So negative. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sergeant, for taking my question. Uh, and maybe you can't answer it, but about two or three years ago, there were six guns <coughs> found in the state of Massachusetts that uh, had been crimes committed with them. Would, did they give the store name? <coughs> they said they came from a store. I'm not aware of that case specifically, but okay. in regards to that question, I, I can elaborate just a little bit. In my position, um, I am in contact with, uh, with ATF quite often, and I can tell you, although I can't provide any statistics here in front of me, I can tell you that quite often um, I'm involved with, uh, with investigations with ATF where uh, guns originate here in New Hampshire and end up being recovered in, in various other states, uh, quite often in Massachusetts, uh, involved in crimes and recovered. And I am aware of that happening quite a bit. In my opinion. Thank you. Uh, just to add to what you just answered, uh, is it your knowledge that those guns that were found, were they stolen from the hacker? No, a lot of them are, are purchased and then transferred illegally, sold illegally. So it's straw purchases? Not necessarily straw purchases, but, but sold to people that uh, are portrayed as being, for example, uh, if someone purchases a gun legally in the state of New Hampshire, a New Hampshire resident, and then arranges in some way, shape, or form, whether through internet or, or some communication, to meet someone at the Rockingham Mall. And that purchase takes place at the Rockingham Mall in the state of New Hampshire. And, and that person who's selling the gun, uh, the only thing that they, that they realize is, oh, th I think this person said they were from New Hampshire. Now, personally known to you, I think this bill would, would sort of enhance what we have on the books now and maybe put people on notice that you really should uh, consider selling that firearm to be something uh, important and something that they should take great care of. Uh, and maybe this penalty uh, would do that in some cases, to prevent some of those guns 
being sold um, without a lot of thought. And certainly some of the provisions in the bill mean certainly if it was sold through an FFL um, wouldn't be a problem as well as um, you know someone that, that produced a concealed carry license. Okay, just to follow up on that, what you described taking place at the Rock Ham Mall, that would be an illegal sale on the face of it because you didn't know the person. Well, define personally known. That's the problem. Any other questions? Oh, Representative Martin has a question. Yeah, thank you for your testimony. And uh, this is a question I seem to ask every time one of these bills comes up. If this was such a problem, how come I never read about this in the newspaper? I never read about indictments uh, from Massachusetts and New Hampshire. There's uh, never any uh, expose coming out. It's always it's always anecdotal stories, but it never there's never any hard factual evidence presented to the people. Why why is that? I don't know that to be true. I mean, I don't I don't deal with the media. I don't call the media. When I hear investigations, uh, I don't control the media. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, are there any Massachusetts sold guns, you know, that were bought in Massachusetts ever used in a crime in New Hampshire? I don't have that knowledge. I don't know. Is there any way you could, you know, check and get back to us on this? I don't know where I would check. I haven't come across any cases like that in my four years All right. running gun line. All right, thank you. If you have further questions, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Representative Hall. Uh, Representative Hull, well, thank you, Chairman and members of Criminal Justice. Representing the Town of Bowen Dunbar, for the record, um, several things. And one, I apologize for writing on a pink card with a red pen. It's probably not easy to read. Uh, but I am in opposed, opposed to this bill. First of all, um, our current statutes have something very similar um, on books. And Sergeant Haggerty just mentioned it, right? Which is 159.7, sales to felons. No person shall sell deliver or otherwise transfer a pistol revolver or any other firearm, okay, to a person who's been convicted in any jurisdiction of a felony, whether whoever violates the provisions of the section shall be guilty of a class B felony. So we basically have something already on the books that is almost verbatim. This opens up a couple of changes. Um, as Sergeant Haggerty pointed out, um, in lines eight and nine, it doesn't address, this, the language as submitted doesn't address the fact that there is a federal mix line um, that would have to be included for any long guns. Um, also, what do you do about lower receivers? Because the language that we supply, lower receivers are technically rifles, but they're sold through the state gun line. So there's, it gets more complicated than just um, trying to address it through those two, right? You have to be very specific in terms of the language that moves forward. Um, under 4473, which is the federal form that prohibits straw purchases, and the prime sponsor talked about straw purchases, <coughs> Um, it says at the top of the form, right, violations of this are punishable by up to 10 years of imprisonment and or a $250,000 fine. So we already have places in federal statute and or state statute that address the issue of straw purchases. Um, Sergeant Haggerty mentioned that knowingly is a problem under sales if you want to sell a firearm to someone currently in the statutes, but then in line four of this bill, you have to know whether the person's prohibited. Um, I don't know how one works and one doesn't. I see, right, there's, a, there's an issue. If we can't know, if you know the person, right, but now you're required to know their entire background as well. So there's again, additional issues there. Um, lastly, there's been something like 136,000 um, background checks through the state gun line um, and or the next gun line in the last year. Some of those were for licenses, some of those were background checks for security and other things, but the predominant number of those were actually for purchase of firearms. Um, I would 
venture a guess, and unfortunately, I'm waiting for the data that Representative Rogers should supply by the end of this week in terms of how many firearms are illegally transferred into Massachusetts. Um, I would venture to say it's a small percentage because if it was any reasonable percentage of 136,000 background checks or potentially that or more firearm sales, um, we would probably know about it. Because I would ask that you vote this IPL as the bill is unnecessary um, as it is already on the statutes both federally um, under 18 U.S.C. 922, I think it's actually section D, not G, as in Delta, um, as well as RSA 159.7. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Sure. Isn't it true that data um, regarding gun purchases, sales, use, injuries, deaths has been continuously uh, been suppressed or opposed by um, certain groups and organizations, so it's very difficult to find um, accurate data? So the CDC records each year and has for a very long time certain pieces of data regarding firearm deaths. Okay. Um, and hence when we're even walking on the House floor and people are bringing up statistics, as in was done last week, I believe, again, those statistics are based on the CDC's information. And CD, CDC actually tracks how someone was killed, right? Whether it was an overdose or whether it was a wound from a knife stabbing or some other thing. Paul? Yes. But isn't even the CDC data restricted? I believe it gets the cause of death and what, what the implement was, which is the well, information. Well, death, I mean, but yes. it's restricted to death. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative, for your mm -hmm. testimony. Uh, isn't the FBI uniform crime report an accurate uh, accounting of uh, crimes committed in the country it is, for all reasons? It is for all reasons, especially for states that are doing full reporting. I believe the state of, uh, sorry, the, the state of Illinois and the, the city of Chicago in particular fails to report some information to that. Otherwise, the statistics would show how bad Chicago is with their owner's gun loss. But New Hampshire is a full reporting, I believe. I'm not a, a law enforcement officer, but I believe report everything to the FBI. Just a follow-up? question. So from that answer, I gather that <clears throat> the uh, state and uh, city that have some of the most restrictive gun laws are the ones that suppress the uh, information about crimes the most? Uh, in the case of Chicago, that is true. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you very much for coming on. Andrew and Rice Hawkins. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Andrew Rice Hawkins. I'm the Executive Director of Grant State Progress. I'm the Patriot Advocacy Organization. You've heard from our organization before. We're very concerned about um, gun violence in the state of New Hampshire and actually. Um, I'm not going to review testimony I gave last year um, about the fact that you have background checks and did you have that or go through the statistics about how successful the program is, because as you just heard from Representative Cole, it is effective in keeping firearms out of the hands of um, felons, domestic abusers, and others who shouldn't um, legally be allowed to carry firearms. I would say, uh, in response to a couple of things that have been said this morning, though, um, as has been referenced, right now our law um, talks about people who are personally known, but it doesn't give them a clear definition of what that means. Now we hear time and again on um, firearms related bills from folks who um, are not in support of stronger public safety measures that responsible gun owners don't transfer their firearms to people they don't know. That's great. I think that that's a, that's a good and positive way that um, responsible gun owners help increase public safety. But we do know from the news reports, from the statistics, that there are those who are less responsible. And this is a good option to enforce the law we have by creating a penalty if you transfer a firearm to somebody who you do not know whether or not they should legally be allowed to have one. It's a great way to keep firearms out of the hands of those who are felons, domestic users, or other users who should not have firearms. Personally, no one could mean that I've known you for five years. It could mean that we were raised together and I 
attended every school dance with you, watched you get married, stood with you. Or it could mean that I saw a, a posting for an ad on arms list, met you for coffee for five minutes, and I'm going to transfer my firearm to you. There's a clear gap in the law here, and this is a great way to improve it. I would say that we uh, have had some conversation this morning about straw purchases. Um, there's a couple of things just to note about that. Federally, the law is really around straw purchases. If you purposely purchase the firearm on the of somebody who you know and they know that they should not have a firearm or they're going to hide their um, relationship to that firearm. This law here that we're looking to improve um, essentially ensures that, again, whether I've known you, uh, for a long time or just for a few minutes, I need to know that you are somebody who should be transferred to firearm. With that, we will ask you to support this bill. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you very much. Jesus. I can see my remarks. Yeah. This is my Woodcock. Good morning. Welcome back. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Miss Casey, good morning. Um, I just had a couple of points about this bill, but I, in listening to the testimony, I had some written testimony, but I think it would be more helpful if I go back and get copies of the federal firearms laws for you in the 4473. Um, one thing that I did want to point out is that there is a misspelling in the bill. Prima facie is spelled with a F. A C I B, not A. Sometimes people pronounce it prima facie. Uh, it's Latin, and so it's subject to a lot of mispronunciations in my experience. Um, I've never heard two lawyers pronounce some of these foreign words the same way on most occasions. Um, one thing that I would uh, say to you is that uh, I've heard some testimony this morning, and I haven't really prepared to talk about this, but. Um, the, the, somebody referred to a Form 4473, and that's a, um, a pure alcohol, tobacco, and firearms form that is used by federally licensed firearms dealers. So that when someone goes in and buys a firearm from a licensed dealer, uh, that person makes um, statements basically saying that the gun is being purchased by them, that they are not purchasing it for someone else, that they are not a convicted felon. They go through a whole list of things. They're not an illegal drug user or something like that. Um, those forms are only used for federally licensed firearms dealers. So that if I were to sell a firearm to someone, um, they would not have to put that, they would not, not have to fill out that form. Um, so when you, when you talk, when they, they talk about it in, in uh, the federal uh, prosecutions as lying and buying, when you talk about a lying and buying purchase, it means that you're lying to the federal firearms dealer, not to an individual. Um, the second thing that I think is interesting about this bill, and, and I think it is really worth considering, is that in a certain sense it gives um, a person who's transferring a gun more protection than the existing law might give them. And that is because it makes it a prima facie um, defense that the person actually has a uh, uh, license. Um, what, what, a, what a prima facie defense is, is um, it, it raises a presumption that the sale is legitimate, and it's a rebuttable presumption. So if somebody showed you a, uh, a license and you knew that they had been in court the day before and that they had a restraining order uh, against that individual, um, then the, the, the charge could be rebutted based on that. But I think it's worth thinking about that because uh, under the existing law, I don't think that there is um, that kind of rebuttable defense. Um, the other things that, that people have talked about are the transfer of guns um, to, and the number of guns that wind up being used uh, as in crimes in Massachusetts and other states. I don't have any statistics in, uh, from, in New Hampshire. As some of you know, I prosecuted federal cases for a long time in Vermont, and it was an ongoing problem. And this is the scenario that I can tell you about. The transfer of guns uh, happens this way. Someone comes to Brattleboro, Vermont, Rockland, Vermont, 
uh, one of the towns that are on the interstate generally or close to one of the major highways. Uh, that individual is selling drugs. Uh, the person who wants the drugs trades the firearms that are easily accessible in Vermont and the guns go back down to Massachusetts or New York. Um, so that when you, when you think about uh, the cities that have strong gun laws, um, those gun laws are being circumvented, essentially. Uh, uh, I don't know that having stronger gun laws in surrounding states would make a difference. Um, I'm not an expert on that area of uh, study. But I do know from having prosecuted a lot of cases in Vermont that that is the way that it works. It is similar here in New Hampshire. The um, gun trafficking and the drug trafficking tend to follow the interstates. Uh, the, the, the drugs that come up to uh, Manchester, Concord, uh, the southern part of the state, come from Lowell, Lawrence, uh, the city of Boston, uh, Worcester. Uh, they, they bring the drugs up here, they trade the drugs for firearms, they bring them back. Um, it's, it's no secret that this happens. It's something that all law enforcement in New Hampshire is very aware of. The people in the, the law enforcement officers in the cities um, of Lawrence, Lowell, Worcester, uh, Boston know this is happening. Um, the drug trafficking in some of those cities, I used to live in Worcester and I drive there now and I barely recognize it. It's it's an entirely different place because of the terrible problems that we have with drugs. So that's what is happening. And I think that this bill makes it a little bit clearer to people that that uh, giving guns to someone that you don't actually know uh, and can't you don't have a, a good faith reason to believe that that person is um, should be entitled to have a firearm. Um, that I think that that makes it clearer. But as I say, I'd like to go back and give the committee a little bit better background on on the federal laws so that you understand how this would interplay with them. And I hadn't thought to do that as I was in here yesterday afternoon trying to get this done before this ice storm rolled in. <laughs> I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. The, what you just described about how the, these firearms end up in other states, Trading a firearm for illegal drugs is a crime. Why do we need, how would this bill affect that? Because as far as I'm concerned, somebody trades a firearm for drugs, well, lock them up. Well, I, I think that there are a couple things, there are a couple of responses I have to that. And one of them goes to Representative Martin's question. Um, a lot of times you don't see indictments or, you know, the, the, the big story isn't that someone was indicted for uh, firearm, giving a firearm to someone who they didn't know or something like that. They may be indicted in a broader case involving uh, drug trafficking. Um, it is already a crime. I, but I think, and, and there are certain circumstances in which I think that the aiding and abetting law could be used to address uh, selling a firearm to a convicted felon. So I mean, I think that there are different things. But one of the things that I think uh, is a help is when the laws are very clear. And I think that this law makes it clearer that uh, you should really have a good reason to sell a gun to someone, that you should, you should, it should be a conscious act. It shouldn't just be, oh, okay, well, you want this, sure, I'll give it to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I couldn't help but notice when I asked Representative Cole about the CDC data, um, some of it being uh, restricted to uh, to death and not other incidences revol uh, involving firearms. I couldn't help but see you nod. And so I, I want to ask you, um, isn't some of the data that, that opponents of such bills um, look to is in fact the same data that is uh, suppressed or restricted by those saying, but, but by groups who somehow have stopped um, information dissemination regarding firearms. I, I think that the representative is right on what the Center for the D Disease Control uh, keeps track of. What they are prevented from doing is doing any real sort of, other than keeping track of the numbers, they're prevented from doing any kind of cause and effect situation. Uh, where where they can look at um, 
I don't know, uh, uh, lead in the water, not to pick a hot topic. Um, uh, lead in the water, they can do studies on what the effect of lead in the water is on uh, the brains of children. Um, and how it affects them and their ability to learn and that kind of thing. They're not allowed to do that kind of research on uh, gun deaths. They're not allowed to do um, research on, uh, on um, mental illness and the relationship of mental illness to gun deaths. They're not allowed to do that kind of research. Um, they, can, they can track what the cause of death is, but they're not allowed to do anything more. And it's been one of the discussions that has come up, I think most recently with some of these mass killings, is that people begin to sort of wonder, well, how is it that uh, the young man in, who went into Sandy Hook and killed all the school children, how is it that somebody whose record of mental illness was so extensive, why was it that, that his mother thought it was a good idea for him to have firearms. What was it that was going on? Um, the same thing is true, I think, of the recent shooting in San Bernardino. Unfortunately, with a lot of these people, I mean, they, they, they're not surrendering, so you don't get to sit down and interview them after the fact. And, um, but, but I think that the concern has been that there isn't, there isn't any opportunity for the Center for Disease Control to actually analyze what the relationship is between these mass shootings and the person who's pulling the trigger. Thank you. Paul? Is the CDC the only national organization that would be appropriate for tracking such data? I, I don't know exactly. There are a lot of federal agencies that that um, that uh, do medical related. The National Institute for Health, for example, does a lot of research. But I think that the prohibition is general. I think that the, that the um, there, there isn't any other agency that's been allowed to pick up this kind of research. Um, and absent a federal agency doing it, I think it would be difficult for, you know, Dartmouth University through the, through the medical center or uh, Johns Hopkins or something like that to do that kind of research because um, the, the question is really sort of, national in scope mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's that's the concern anyway I don't know that I don't know that the other institutions other medical institutions have tried to do it uh, but I think that it would be difficult thank you thank you mr. chairman and thank you for your testimony sure so with, with the lack of all this reporting that all the information is suppressed or it's not reported how many illegal gun transfers were prosecuted in the state of New Hampshire in 2015? I don't know the answer to that because, uh, frankly, the Attorney General's office doesn't do it. Um, the, a lot of the gun transfers in New Hampshire might be prosecuted federally, and I don't know what the U.S. Attorney's Office's um, policy is on that. I can look to find how many indictments involving uh, uh, gun transfers were returned in the district court in New Hampshire for you. I can, I can look that up. They have a computer system, and I can see how many charges there were brought. Um, I don't know whether the county attorneys are doing uh, a lot of this work or not. I just don't have that information. I do know from my experience that the transfer of weapons uh, illegal transfer of weapons almost always involves another crime. It's never just that the person goes in and lies on Form 4473 or that uh, I give a gun to somebody I don't know. Um, and I, I think that we all know that some of the results of the illegal possession of firearms have been devastating. I mean, it's no secret that Michael Addison was not entitled to possess a firearm, but he had one on the night he killed Officer Briggs. You follow up? Follow up question. Again, it's, you know, I've, I've only been here uh, a little over a year now. We keep hearing these bills and people come in time and time and time again and tell us how bad it is. But when I ask for statistics, nobody's got any. Well, I don't, uh, I, I understand your concern, Representative Martin. 
and I will do my best to tell you what I can find out from searching the federal database. I can get that information for you. I don't know that the county attorneys keep records on this, and generally, um, the attorney general's office is not in the business of prosecuting people simply for the illegal possession of a firearm. I can tell you that in most of the homicides that we have in New Hampshire, the weapon of choice is gun, and most of the time the person shouldn't have had it, either because the person was mentally ill, the person was under a restraining order, or in the case of Michael Addison, the person was convicted felon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, several times you have alluded, uh, uh, you have it written where you said more gun laws would would not stop illegal firearms from going into Massachusetts and New York. I don't, uh, I don't think I said that. Well, you, you were talking about Vermont. I, I, I told you I told you that I'm I'm not certain because I don't have the statistics that if there were stronger gun laws in the surrounding states that the cities would be able to enforce their gun laws. I know from having lived in Washington D.C., which had very tough gun laws, that the guns came in from Virginia, which had almost none. I know that from experience because I prosecuted gun cases in the District of Columbia. And if Virginia had had tougher gun laws, there would have been fewer guns in Washington, D.C. The gun laws in Maryland were tough. The gun laws in Virginia were not. And that's where the guns came into Washington. They came into Washington the same way they come into um, Boston. They come in because the people in Virginia come into Washington, D.C. to buy drugs. They trade guns for drugs. I saw it happen dozens of times. And I've seen it happen in prosecuting cases in Vermont as well. I've seen the transfer of guns from states that have easy gun laws for the purpose of getting drugs or being involved in the drug trade, and those guns go right back down to the big cities. That's my testimony. Right. But you were, you know, you're saying, a follow up, uh, you're saying how. You know, there's always other illegal, uh, in some cases, other illegal activities. There are. So, I mean, so a law abiding citizens, which I'm assuming everyone in this room, you know, how is this law going to stop the illegal activity of the gun sales? What it will do, and I, I think that this is something for you to consider, um, laws are meant in part to govern criminal behavior. The way that they govern criminal behavior is by allowing grand juries to return indictments. Clear laws allow grand juries to return clear indictments. Clear indictments with clear evidence leads lead to convictions. I think that this law is clearer than the law uh, that is currently on the books because I think that personally known or how whatever the phrase is, is a, is a somewhat vague phrase. It would be more difficult to prosecute the case under that circumstance. But what you're looking for when you're, when you're passing a law is not simply to give individuals notice, which is extremely important, believe me. I believe in giving people very clear notice that something is against the law. I don't like the ambiguity in laws. I don't think it's fair to a defendant. It makes it much harder to try the case, and it makes it much harder for the jury to consider it. I think that this law is clearer than the existing law. Thank you. If you have further question, thank you very much for your testimony. <coughs> I will email you a better statement, uh, giving you some more information, thank Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning. <coughs> Um, I'm going to defend felons today because not everybody who's a felon is a violent person. Uh, there's, it's actually relatively easy to get called a felony in this day and age. And uh, but let me tell you about a friend of mine who is a co-worker. I host a radio show um, called Free Talk Live. My my co-host, who's been with the show, uh, been with the show for more than a decade, spent nine years in prison in Florida. Now, he did something wrong when he was 17. You know, now he's in his 40s, so he's not the same person that he was when he was 17. And he spent time in prison, and now he's out, and now he has a family. 
and he can't defend his family with a weapon. Um, so, you know, he basically just has to hope that no one wants to target him for maybe some of the things that he said on the radio, come to his house, do who knows what to his family, because he can't legally uh, defend himself because he's a felon. And he's not the only one. There are plenty of felons who spent time in jail for whatever their crime was, whether it was violent or nonviolent, and then for the rest of their lives, they are prohibited from having what is supposed to be a right to bear arms. And if something is a right, then you shouldn't be able to have that abrogated. You shouldn't be able to just have that taken away from you. Um, this isn't going to stop violent people. The lady from the Attorney General's office already admitted. She went through these you know, lists of uh, examples of people who she said shouldn't have had guns. They legally shouldn't have had the gun, but they did anyway. And that's because someone who is, let's say they're a felon, they get out of jail, they want to turn their life around, they can't have a gun legally. They're more likely to be law-abiding. But a felon who doesn't give a damn, they're just going to go right ahead and do whatever they need to do. They've got the criminal connections and the underground or whatever to get the guns that they need to get. So all these people shouldn't legally have had these guns, but they did anyway. So the laws don't prevent uh, those who are lawless. The laws don't prevent the outlaws, so to speak, from getting their hands on guns. And what this law will do is it'll just put more peaceful people in jail who have not actually hurt anyone. Giving someone a gun isn't a crime because there is no victim. And when the state police say, oh, well, this will just be, you know, you can just say you didn't know, that the not knowing will be a defense. Well, the judge decides whether or not you know something. And it can be relatively hard to prove knowingly. So if the judge just decides that he thinks you knew, well, that's enough for conviction. You're going to jail. In fact, you're going to prison in this particular case. Uh, so beyond that, uh, I don't think that this is a good law, so I'm uh, in opposition to it. And in fact, I think it goes the wrong direction. What we really need to do is restore felons' rights to bear arms. Um, again, anyone who is, you laugh, you laugh, but uh, remember, the people who are violent and dangerous are not going to follow your laws at all. The, the felons who want to turn their lives around are prohibited from ever defending themselves the way the rest of us can do that. And uh, that's wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Jennifer Panelakis, you have a question? Thank you for taking my question. It's a, would you believe that it's, uh, in the state of New Hampshire you can petition to have them erased? Sure, you can do that. And my friend, uh, well, he was convicted in Florida originally, but he went through that process there and went in front of, I believe it was Jeb Bush at the time, and uh, begged to have his rights restored. Of course, it was denied, even though he's led an exemplary life and is a family man now. So, yeah, you can beg. That's true. Not begging with the petition. That's the same thing. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Have a lot of your ex felon friends been attacked in their homes? Thankfully, he has not been attacked in his home. You but he does live in New Hampshire where it's relatively safe because of widespread firearms well, ownership. Do you know of any people that have been attacked in their homes because they didn't have a gun? Whether it's in their homes or not in their homes, I do know of a friend who was convicted of a felony. His name's Rich Paul. He never hurt anybody. He sold a little bit of weed in Keene. Um, he was attacked on Central Square out in the open. Now, he was not able to defend himself with a firearm, but he happened to have a, uh, a monopod for a video camera with him, and he was able to defend himself with that. And uh, the state tried to put him back in prison for that. Ultimately, he was victorious in court because it was shown that he wasn't carrying the monopod as a weapon. He was carrying it as a monopod and then happened to use it in a defensive Not way. Not knowing what a monopod is. Well, that gentleman has a tripod behind you, which means three legs. Mono would be one leg. No further questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, let everybody know that at 10.30 I'm going to close the public hearing, and if there's anybody here who wants us to talk, we will open it up later. Thank you, Chairman. Um, for those for the record, my name is Penny Bean, and this bill is a train wreck for a lot of reasons. Starting with the very beginning, the drafters of this bill didn't understand basic New Hampshire law of federal law clearly. Um, there are things that would be required under this bill that are actually against the law. And, and that is a starting point. Um, they're talking about the transfers of proof through the licensing gun unit. 
I presume by that that they want them to use the next line, and that can't happen because it's federal law. So you, what you're doing is passing a law to ask state officials to violate federal law, which I would presume you would all agree would not be a good plan to begin with. Um, but when you start in the very beginning of this, you have to ask yourself what problem you're trying to solve. And to say that drug dealers are always looking to trade drugs for um, guns is just not true at all. It's provably not true. Usually drug dealers want money. They want some guns, too, to protect their drugs, but in general, they're looking to make a profit. They want money. What this is going to do is catch people, innocent people, in a net. There is, you're asking people to violate the law of confidentiality that we, that all of you in the past worked so hard to pass pertaining to fire motor licenses, RSA 1596, confidentiality. What you're doing is forcing people to disclose those licenses. I think that's a problem. I think the beliefs beyond the proponents um, are a problem. If you, I quoted one of the Attorney General states entitled to have a firearm as if, as if people have to beg to get a firearm. You know, saying people think they're entitled to get a firearm. Um, the bottom line is in this particular thing is this bill <laughs> ultimately wants to destroy I think it's RSA 159.14, but I could be wrong. What it wants to do is basically outlaw or prohibit the private sale and transfer of handguns. That's what this bill will do as a practical matter. Um, it, it's really, really insidious. And I think the problem with that <clears throat> is it's not clear on its face. They don't want to put that because that's something that just isn't right in this country and it wouldn't be the correct thing to do. And that's really what this bill intends to do. And I can tell you that as a private attorney, people came to me and said, gee, this bill passed, and I want to sell a gun to my neighbor. I would say you're opening yourself up to huge liability. Just to defend yourself against these charges is a huge thing. It's expensive, and it's risky. And how can you know? How can the average person know? Okay? I don't know what everyone does. I don't know if you just walked out of court and got a domestic violence misdemeanor against you or a domestic violence um, restraining order against you which would prohibit you from having firearms. I don't know with today's fancy handy dandy computers that you didn't just have your son, probably a five year old because they're best with computers, forge a license to carry that you showed me. There's just a million things that you're putting an onus on private citizens that simply isn't right. There are a myriad of federal law and state laws that you can charge someone under for violating laws. And I think the strongest argument against this bill is the Assistant Attorney General's own words. And again, I quote, always involves another crime. And so the bottom line is, instead of charging someone with 10 crimes, you got to charge them with eight or nine crimes. I think that's enough to convict them if the courts in the system does their job. Adding another crime is just not helpful. What you're essentially saying is people who sell people another car should first make sure they don't have a deal with because that person can't be driving the car. I mean, it's just not reasonable and it's not the way things work. And I want to correct some misinformation. Um, the CDC is a primarily discredited agency. They are a political agency. They have not, they're not well respected at all, and that's the reason Congress has stopped um, giving our taxpayer dollars to that agency because they have a political agenda as opposed to there's a lot of um, data out there by unbiased academic agencies. And the CDC among most academics, quite frankly, is discredited. One of the things that they did in the past was they included 19-year-olds in the definition of children so they could claim the murder rate was higher on the children it was raising. And what it was catching was huge amounts of inner drug wars and gang deaths and we're saying these children are being killed and that it's just academically dishonest. And I think the other thing, just to address one of the other representatives' questions, in New Hampshire you can get a petition annulled, but the court can still decide to deny that. And courts regularly do, as a matter of fact, there's Supreme Court cases on it. But what's more important and what most people don't understand is the conviction of the state where it occurs matters. So let's say a person had a conviction in Massachusetts or Maine or somewhere else. Federal law looks to the state law where the person was convicted not to New Hampshire. So even if that person moves to New Hampshire, 
federal losses, you first have to satisfy the state where you came from. <coughs> and in New Hampshire, um, they're not annulled when you get a certificate of annulment. It restores your rights, but those records are still there. They're there for law enforcement. They're available for sentencing purposes. If that person goes and commits another crime and they're convicted of that, that annulled um, conviction can be used for purposes of sentencing. So there's a lot of tools out there to law enforcement, huge amounts of tools that maybe people aren't aware of because they don't do this every day. And, and that's important to look at. Um, whenever people talk about prima facie evidence, you're looking that you're in court. And you have to ask yourself, do you be, I've had husbands and wives come to me over issues where I represent them over. And they've been married 20 years. And one of the other had a conviction 25 years ago they didn't tell the other about. So, you know, and that happens. I hate to say that. I mean, and the only reason they finally do now is because I'm doing certain type of work for them while I'm doing background checks. It's what I call the come to the Lord moment, you know, where they're, they're going to get found out and they have to tell. So what I'm trying to say to you is you cannot, the average person cannot possibly be certain to the point of not being charged with a crime that the person that they are selling a firearm to is not prohibited any more than the gun line is perfect. If you talk to dealers, federal firearms licensees, they will tell you that they call the gun line or nix, whatever they're supposed to, depending on if it's a long gun. And they get an approval number. They're then told sometimes days later, oh, we made a mistake. Nothing is perfect. There's no, there's no guarantees in life. There's no magic talisman. But what this bill is going to do is essentially outlaw private sale of firearms in the state. And I think that's a travesty and it's wrong. And the method by which you do it is going to keep me and my brother in, in business for a long time because I, I think right away an injunction would be filed. You can't make the gun line do these checks. You just, you just can't. You see, isn't it true that if you commit a crime and there's a firearm involved, it's an extra charge? Absolutely. There are. And I didn't bring my list of federal felonies here. I have a whole list. Um, a, a whole, I have prepared that I can give to the committee. I'm happy to email it to the committee. A whole list of all the different conspiracy and stuff charges and the average transfer to a prohibited person. If the feds charge correctly, which they rarely do, okay? They should, but they rarely do. Hundreds and some years. Potential prison time, absolutely. There's, there's several provisions of 18 U.S.C. 921 through 923 that apply, that have been on the book for decades. Thank you very much for that. Questions? Mr. Martin has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the testimony. Uh, I had a situation last year, and I went by you, and you can tell me if I broke the law. The <laughs> gentleman I never met in Plastow had a firearm I wanted to buy. As it worked out, I have a federal firearms curio and relic collector's license, and so did he. <clears throat> Sight unseen, he sent me a copy of his electronically. I sent him a copy of mine electronically. He boxed it up and sent it to me. Never met each other, never spoke except by email. Did either one of us break a law? You both had CNR licenses, right? Yes. And it was a CNR. Mm -hmm. it was a, the bottom line is now, no, but here's the thing. Because you relied on his CNR license, which is very reasonable, because before you get that, the ATF does the check and makes you go through, you know, your imagination. But let me tell you the problem with this. With this, you've got a problem. Because what if he's prohibited in some way? You relied on his federal firearms license, which is reasonable, you know, his, his CNR license, carry on relics, collector's license. You've got a problem here. Because you can't know for sure about that man's history. And if the ATF missed it, that they're still going to prosecute you, and, and that's what you're looking at there. That's that's what you're looking at there. And so I think you have a problem here. You know, I think there's 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 tons of laws on the book right now. There's probably at least ten laws giving substantial prison time, and that's ten off the top of my head. Probably twenty or thirty just on point. Doesn't um, consider the other about eighteen thousand around the book, nineteen thousand. There, there's plenty of ways to prosecute people. Um, I see this as just, like I said, a backdoor attempt at outlawing private sale. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Dean. Uh, did I, wasn't he able to check that gentleman's number? He was able to check the gentleman's number, okay? Because there's an FFL easy check, okay? But there's two things. 
<clears throat> even if that gentleman's FFL Easy Check number came back good, and most dealers actually save the page or print out the page to show that they checked it and it was good on that day, that still would defend him. He would still spend a whole lot of money being charged initially um, with a felony, which means, let me tell you what happens with a felony. As part of a felony, they're going to indict him. He's I understand what you're saying, but you, you are really? saying, further question, you are saying even though a license is all right when he purchased it, that they're going to convict him afterwards when he can show him a piece of paper saying it was? No, I'm not saying they're going to convict him. I'm saying they're going to charge him. I'm saying they're going to charge him. It depends on, and charging is incredibly risky and expensive. Meanwhile, while they're sorting him out, he's under felony indictment. They're taking all his guns. He can't buy any more guns under felony indictment. He is prohibited from acquiring any. He's going to have to hire a lawyer, which makes my brother in all rich and happy, um, and spend a whole pile ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars and probably eight or nine months of his life. Now I'm not saying he's gonna be convicted because if the jury if the New Hampshire judge follows the law and allows jury nullification to be explained to them and he's allowed to show that page, no, I'm not saying he's gonna be convicted. I'm saying he's gonna go through some misery and some expense. Did you have a further question? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cushing. Blue Sheet. Representative Martin, will you give her your address so she can fill you that question? <laughs> 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 send it to the state. That was a good one. <laughs> I might as well get paid, too. Yes. <laughs> We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.